Um, so we've just had a talk about 400 gigs at R, and that by itself is already quite on the edge of innovation. So in this session, we're actually going to take it a step further and actually look at the next speed that is being standardized and that you also find available now, which are routers with 800 gig client interfaces. Um, to your point, my name is Jonas Vermeulen. I'm, I'm running technical sales for the Nokia web scale uh, segment. Um, and I mean, some people have already tapped me on the shoulder here in the conference and thought like, hey, Nokia, are they still selling phones? It's not what we do anymore. We, we give that as a brand, people license it, they, stick, they put it as a sticker on the phone, on their phone. So what we are doing is taking care of interconnectivity needs. And so we focus a lot on indeed like WDM needs, router needs, switching needs. Um, and in this particular session, we're gonna specifically focus on that router aspect um, and how over time innovation has kicked in and, and how they're getting faster and faster. Um, part of it is indeed just following the user demand. Our customers ask for, for faster routers, for bigger routers. Um, the pandemic is part of that. You saw a lot of bandwidth increase there. Another driver for higher or more powerful routers is just the fact that um, DDoS attacks are becoming um, higher in intensity, consume more uh, bandwidth, and you, your routers need to be protected for that. And then more and more we live in, an, in a greener world. I mean, I think this morning session on the circular, um, um, yeah, the circular technology already gave a good example of, of how we could reuse and repurpose hardware. So power efficiency and sustainability is also very important nowadays in the design of routers. Now, as we're then thinking about designing a router, in the end, it's not just about pushing a packet from an, a source or a, to a destination interface and, and doing a lookup. When we as Nokia look at the design of routers, we think basically on highly resilient routers, MPLS routers, that do this at very high speeds, where we put a lot of focus in making sure that there are no packet drops, no hiccups, that it can cope with DDoS attacks, that it can do with all kinds of, of header information in the front. And we want to do that with more and more focus on power, manageability, overall TCO, right? Um, and on the right hand side, you see one of those pictures of a Nokia router. But in the end of the day, what it really comes down to is taking a packet of your trend at the source interface, at the transceiver, figuring out how you need to put that optical signal down onto your line card over a third days bus and giving in that to a packet processor, right? That packet processor can be a mix of a Mac ASIC and, an, and the packet processor itself. Um, and all those individual items, they're all placed on that line card and you need to, at a higher speed, as we heard also before, I mean, they consume more and more energy. So more and more also airflow and power distribution becomes important and the design of a router. Now, the title of the presentation was all about 800 gig, right? And 800 gig is specifically is obviously at that transceiver. That's where it is. In, I mean, that's where it's the design is for here. So let's have a look at what that means an 800 gig transceiver. Here you see basically a magnified picture of such a transceiver, and it's basically the same if you take a hundred, a four hundred, or an 800 gig uh, transceiver. You basically have a few components on it. And then if you look left to right, you basically see the photonic driver. And that's basically a set of lasers. And if you think about your familiar 100 gig QSFP28, it'll have four lasers, typically SR4 or, or CWM4 or, or LR4. You then have in the middle a DSP or a, and combined with the multi-link gearbox that takes the inputs from your line cards, the electrical signals, does some fact, does some uh, modulation, demodulation, figures out how the photonic signal needs to be and sends that off to the following driver. And on the right hand side, you see basically your attachment unit interface, which is really the connector that goes in towards your line cards or into your router itself. You saw that already in the last presentation, there is a number of standards on it, but that's basically 
the, the standard for which, um, which is agreed so that every optical vendor can basically interwork with, with your router vendor. Um, now, that is a particular transceiver, and, and what you saw over the last years is basically an evolution to just two types of transceiver or cage types. And I've called them here, you have narrow cages and you have wide cages. Narrow cages is what we're all used to. It's like your SFP, your SFP Plus, your SFP 28. They're very small, many of them fit in a line card. It's basically where you used to plug in 10 gig pluggables. Those have basically evolved now to support 25 gig, 50 gig, but also now 100 gig. Yeah, so you will, I'll show you some examples of that in the next slide. Um, but that's basically how we see the evolution of your current 100 gig signal to basically trans 10 gig signal towards the future 100 gig over that small SFP form factor. You then have also the white cages, which is the QSFP form factor. And you have that at QSFP28, and you see here already on the slide, all the way up to 800 gig. So basically with those two gauge types, you can underpin, you can power up a lot of many different um, speeds. You can support a lot of different transceiver types. You can also see on the slide two interesting evolutions. I think one of them is the evolution to single lambda which is very important as you want to make more use of those single cages and as we go on to 800 gig. And the other one, I think we've seen in the last session, which, which is how do we put more and more intelligence inside a transceiver and make sure it's compatible with long haul, which is basically the evolution towards 400 gig ZR, ZR plus. Let's have a look at those narrow cages. So the dimensions are shown on the slide. They're 13.4 millimeter wide, and you can see that basically supports SFP, SFP, SFP plus 28. When they're a bit deeper, you basically have two attachment interfaces, and then it becomes SFPDD. And the next interface, and the next step is SFP 112. Gradually, you see that it basically goes up in speed what they support all the way to the very last column, SFP112, is basically a 100 gig electrical interface towards your line card. On the optical side of things, it's actually even more interesting because you see on two of those models that uh, little icon of 100 gig lambda. 100 gig lambda is basically the standardized standard on how you modulate 100 gig signal down to a single optical wave onto your, onto your fiber. And that could be typically single mode, but could also be multi-mode. Um, and that's how you basically see an evolution, even if you want to carry 100 gig, to do that over DR1, FR1, or LR1. And those are more or less your new names or your new te terms that you will see in a data center, that you will see how you interconnect to IXPs, of what you can, um, how you want to interconnect your routers. Now, why is it nice to, to go for narrow cages or these smaller cages to support 100 gig? It just means that you can put much more capacity on your faceplate. Rather than having a box that does, an example, 48, 10 gig, and six times 100, you basically will now see form factors that can do 48 times 100 gig SFPDD plus maybe six times QSFPDD. I mean, that will all be able, that will all fit in a single RU. Now, it doesn't mean that it's not compatible with your existing formats. It just means that if you're interconnecting like a router that has these modern SFPDD cages and you want to interconnect it to a router that has legacy QSFP28, it just means that on the QSFP28 side, you will have to plug in something that is also supporting that DR1, the FR1, or the LR1 um, port, I mean, uh, modulation type. Now, taking the, the step further, that evolution towards 100 gig single lambda has also is, was key in also enabling 400 gig. 
So what you see on the slide here is four different form factors on the QSFP family, ranging from QSFP Plus, which was 40 gig, QSFP 28, which is 100 gig, QSFP DD, which enables 400 gig, and on the very last column, QSFP DD 800, which is then basically carrying eight times that 100 gig single lambda over its fiber, right? Those eight times 100 gig, that's all on PAMP4, and it's basically within that little transceiver, you will basically have a small mux that combines eight different 100 gig channels down onto a single fiber, amplifies it, and basically sends it out over, your, um, over the fiber itself. A little bit more information about that QSF PDD 800. Um, overall, it's already stand the form factor itself has been standardized in an MSA uh, last year, May 24th. And the good thing is here that it's, I mean, that's the important why I put them all on the previous slide together, that it's a fully backward compatible cage. So in that cage, you will be able to fit QSFP Plus, QSFP 28, QSFP DD 200, QSFP 400, and QSFP DD 800. Um, now you might think, hey, I've never heard about 800 gig. It's indeed new in the market, but we have already the transceivers available now that do have DR8, so that means eight times 100 gig over a single optic. The same thing with DR8 plus, which is enabling the same over two kilometer, or an optic that does two by 400 gig clear channel. And basically in course of next year, um, it's also the clear channel 800 gig, which will be standardized. It's already available if you want to run on basically pre-standard transceivers, but next year we're expecting this actually to be fully ratified. The one important thing that I haven't talked about so far is basically that interconnection with that line card. When we're making the step towards 800 gig transceivers, that interface is now running on, eight, on 100 gig Sir, this bus. So that means that the interface from your transceiver down onto your line card into your route processor, your Mac ASIC, is not anymore running on 10 gig lanes, 25 gig lanes, 50 gig lanes. It runs as, an, as an, a number of 100 gig Sir, these lanes. And that's obviously important. As your router becomes, I mean, has higher densities, you need to be able, with a number of manageable lanes on your print plate, to, to get all that data down into your interfaces, right? And if you were to do that all with 50 gig lanes, which is the kind of the standard of today, it would consume so much power, it would be so difficult to cool, that you basically can't enable that inside on a line card with a sufficient amount of transceivers. So that upgrade to 100 gig surveys has been pivotal, has been really essential for us as Nokia, and, and, but it's going to be the case for every router vendor to bring routers on the market that support 800 gig. Um, overall, that 100 gig surveys is any kind of standard, I mean, it's basically being used to do any chip-to-chip -chip communication. And then, it's a bit of a difference compared to before. Before it was all 50 gig was black and white signal. Here it's basically using PAM4, right? So it's just same baud rate, just using PAM4 to increase uh, the number of the chip, the, the bit rate between chips. Overall, so it's, it's an essential upgrade of the, the, the line card communication. It's complex, but it's the only way how you can basically get enough fan out towards all your interfaces from your chip. It's necessary to reduce power on those line cards. Um, and overall we see that, yeah, it's basically the next step of what needs to be done on, a, on the line card evolution. Um, the next step is basically going into the route processor itself. So we basically have a Mac ASIC and a packet processor. That's the Nokia way of doing things. I mean, it's, some people have combined that function. 
The reason why Nokia we do it in two different uh, stages is because on the Mac ASIC, developing a specific Mac ASIC allows us to be more flexible and to develop a higher compatibility between all kinds of line rates to do some oversubscription on the line card itself while we keep the packet processor fully unblocked. Um, so what it allows us to do is basically with that Mac ASIC is to support any speed on whatever cage you have. So if you think about it, in the beginning of the, the presentation I talked about two different cages. I talk, talked about the narrow cage, a small like SFP compatible cage. I talked about the QSFP, the bigger cage. And you, you basically can select so many transceivers that you can plug in in each one that we as a vendor, we don't want to impose a restriction there, right? So by having a powerful Mac ASIC, it's able to adapt to whatever speed, to whatever transceiver you plug in into each and every cage, right? We can do that on a line card level, but in the same way, you could also do it on smaller devices that you can then deploy as a peering site or as a transit router, because then it allows you to look at your client, look at your customer, see what interface speed they want to basically interconnect to, and basically you can adapt in the router yourself, and then you can configure it. Today maybe at 40 gig, Tomorrow when he upgrades to 100 gig, you can do it. The day after when he wants to do 400 gig, you can still all do that with the very same box. Um, I'm gonna skip that one. Because I wanna talk a little bit still on airflow and power. Because um, you could think, hey, you could hear about those optics just before that could heat up to 50 to 60 degrees, right? So in the end, it becomes important that within your router design, you give sufficient attention to how you distribute your power and how you cool all these active elements from a transceiver down to the Mac ASIC, down to the, the, the packet processor itself. One thing to do there as you build router is to, to use basically orthogonal planes so that you can basically suck in air from the front and that it cools down your line card and, the, and your SFM. The other thing is to basically ensure that you distribute your air as evenly as possible. And that basically means that on your print plate, rather than putting cages right on top of each other, another design that we've done, but that everybody could do, is to basically make this a very symmetrical design and making sure like your top cage sits at the top of your print plate, your bottom cage sits at the bottom. And that means that you can suck can suck in, power, suck in air from the top, from the bottom, and you basically can cool twice the amount as what you could do with a standard design, right? So that's basically the difference between a stacked SFP cage and a belly-to-belly -belly SFP cage, right? It also means that if you take our line cards or our routers and you flip them upside down, they basically will look the same, because you basically have the same components on the top, same components at the bottom. And with that, um, I hope I've given you a little bit of insight in what it requires to, to support 800 gig on your routers. So you've seen a little bit on the platform design, the mechanics around it, a little bit on chipset information, and quite a bit on purely the transceiver side. Um, because yeah, it becomes, you have a plethora, you have a lot of transceivers now to choose from, but also know that we can uh, all support them on our routers. With that, um, I basically come to the end of my presentation, and I see there is a few more minutes maybe for a question. 50 seconds, I see. So let's see. So one question. Anyone? Anything in the chat? The, there is one question in the ch chat about uh, the availability of the slides. Uh, we will put them on the website uh, in two to three days. Link will be github.com dnoc media. So stay tuned. So thank you very much, Jonas. And, uh, You're welcome.